Welcome to Spotlight On, a new series produced by Excel, where we examine the technology shaping our world through conversations with the people building it. Today, I'm your host, Ben Fletcher, partner at Excel, and I'm really excited because I'm joined here today with Mike Murchison, the CEO of Ada. Thanks for coming in, Mike. Great to be here, Ben. How you doing? I'm doing really good. I'm excited to talk about Ada. I'm excited to talk about what it means to be an AI native company. I think we got a bunch to cover today. Awesome. So Mike, we're going to talk a lot today about AI and about LLMs and how you all have been building for the future and taking advantage of a lot of the new technological advancements. Mm -hmm. But maybe take us back to the founding story of, of Ada and how things got started, because this was 2016, seven, seven years ago, mm -hmm. and you all started as an AI first customer support company. But walk okay. us through founding story and how things got started. Ada started in 2016, but two years before that, we were working on a completely different product, a B2C social search engine called Volley. And the long story short is that Volley was growing very quickly and we encountered a customer service problem. We couldn't keep up with our customer service demand mm -hmm. and scale our operations accordingly. We started to witness uh, our relationship with our customers change mm -hmm. as a function of our growth. Um, and specifically, we saw our team and ourselves go from wanting to talk to our customers a lot mm -hmm. to really being focused on avoiding customer contact. <laughs> and I think simply put, that really bothered us Yeah. Um, because we're, we were very product oriented people. We care so much about the feedback our customers give us. Mm -hmm. And it felt very um, antithetical to that, that core belief to be focused on rejecting our customer's input, mm -hmm. which yeah. is what our customer service operations were focused on. And, and, and I remember the story, you called all these folks you were thinking about, you know, how do you scale this? And then you asked all these folks, can we just sit in your call centers right. and yeah. can we learn? That's can right. we, you know, figure yeah. out what your customers are asking and let's yeah. learn before we launch our next and before we build our product? That's right. We actually joined the seven different customer service teams from a dingy office on the east end of Toronto. And David and I performed customer service for what ended up actually being almost the first year of this company. Hmm. We learned... First of all, that 30% or more of the inquiries we were responding to were repetitive and mundane questions. Mm, yep. In some cases, actually, it's upwards of 80%, depending on the vertical that the company yeah. worked in. It's like, where's my package, password reset, and you're just getting that over and over again. Yeah. That's right. Two, we learned that the agent experience of responding to customers inside incumbent, what, what I now call human-first software, mm -hmm. um, it's highly negative. Like no one is waking up out of bed in the morning going, I can't wait to spend more time in my agent desktop. Like yeah. it's just, it's not a compelling product experience. And specifically the software company that makes that, that, that those agent desktops, they're actually not incentivized to make the agent more productive yeah. because they sell agent seat licenses. Mm -hmm. And so automation and AI have always been this bolt on consideration, not a core you know, deeply considered value proposition that was being offered to the, the, the end user. And then third, our colleagues, they all wanted to talk to their customers in more modern channels. Yeah. They wanted to talk to them over social channels. They wanted to text them. And the idea of turning on a social channel was always sort of rejected. Because again, it was, it was the, the strategy was to talk to your customers less and not more. So, it was on the back of, of those three core learnings that we set out to figure out you know, how, how we could solve this. And we simply put, like, we just worked really hard. <laughs> like we became yeah. the number one or number two agents on each one of these teams just manually. Like we woke up all hours of the night, we were the first people to answer the simple inquiry. And and then, and, and was this crafting, you know, a better agent platform that you wanted to build? Was this crafting how you were going to respond, how you were going to build the company? Was it always the goal of, we're now going to go launch a better way to do this? The goal was always, how do we improve the customer service experience? Yeah. Like we, we were, the, the technology just became a vehicle for delivering the value 
it wasn't the value itself. I think that's something that's been so true since our founding, since this early this early emphasis. The technology is the vehicle. It does. It's not inherently valuable. Mm-hmm. What, what's valuable is that we help an end customer, a user. We help them get the help they're looking for. We help them resolve their inquiry. Yeah. And so the fastest way for us to do that initially was literally manual, and we did it ourselves. But over time, when we became again some of the most productive agents on these teams, we started to become really familiar with the problems that we were facing as agents mm-hmm. that we that we could that would actually if we solved would allow us to be to solve more inquiries for customers and that's when the first real product of ADA was born yeah we let it run inside these accounts we took an AI approach because we had access to so much data we focused on making our AI as easy to use as possible because all our colleagues were non-technical and when we let it run, we knew we were onto something because we didn't get fired. Like our, our managers in these companies, they were like, they didn't care. What they cared about was the value was being delivered. More customers were being helped. Mm-hmm. And that was almost the perfect A-B test that really led us to realize, okay, if we can put AI in the hands of customer service teams, allow them to help more customers, help them resolve more, I think we can transform the future of customer service. And that's, what, as you know, we've been focused on ever since. Yeah, I remember early on when you were walking us through the product and... um you know, it was, it was very deep on the integrations that you had built, not just for like the agent handoff. So you had all the data, you had the conversation history, you had the information yeah. about the customer, yeah. but it was also the deep hooks you had into the end systems. Yeah. I can change your billing plan. I can change into your ERP. I can update your CRM. There were a lot of like bespoke integrations that you all had built into the product. So it was, it was pretty much plug and play for your end customers when they wanted to actually make any of these actions. And I think even today where it's like, you know, the, the big unlock for ChatGPT was when they launched their ecosystem and they launched plugins. And, you know, early days for Ada, that's what you all were building for customer support. Was how do you actually take action and how do you actually do these things if you are going to have an automated agent that's helping your end customers? That's exactly right. It turns out that when a customer is asking for help, they they're really they're really looking for you to do something for them. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the quality of customer experience tends to improve when you you don't just tell a customer what they should do. Yeah. You actually do it for them. Totally. You know? Totally. Instead of instructing someone how to reset their password, yeah. it's a lot it's a lot better experience just to reset it for them. And and walk me through, I mean, this is 2016 to 2019, you know, the technical capabilities that you all are yeah. building, you know, out of University of Toronto, you're going yeah. and grabbing, you know, folks that are coming from the Valley, from New mm-hmm. York. How you thought about getting that technical muscle so that you could build all these capabilities? Ada initially was really a, 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 a an NLU engine that made it ex- exceptionally easy for you to understand the intent of a customer inquiry and then to run a workflow, mm-hmm. a conversational workflow um, that is matched or paired with that uh, the, the intent that's classified. And our approach to this has always been, again, what's the fastest way for us to increase resolution? Initially, we used off-the-shelf uh, NLU engines mm-hmm. that were that were available. I think we we used we used Facebook technology at one point in a company called Wit, Wit.ai. I'm, I'm going back now to you know the early days. We we used uh, Google's technology and Dialogflow. And then over time, we built our own NLU models yep. that outperformed um, what was available off the shelf. Um, and we got very, very good at that. We were using large language models as soon as they were really available, uh, initially to augment the bot builders inside Ada mm-hmm. who were uh, creating uh, conversational flows uh, that you know helped resolve inquiries for their customers. And what Again, happened over time as those models became more capable. We made the leap to put the large language model at the core of ADA and replace the NLU model. Mm. And that's and these been, are your own models. You know, you're now, you know, you're 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 weaning off of some of these other open source or some of these larger models, and you all are are thinking through, okay, how do we make sure we bring that in-house? And as the capabilities are coming out for large language models, you're making sure you're incorporating them into the brain or into the core systems and infrastructure for how it is built. That's right. And I think you know, the, for us, that transition wasn't very challenging for us to make mm-hmm. because, again, 
you know, we've been an AI native company from day one. Initially, the AI model model or models at the core of ADA were NLU models. Mm -hmm. Now they're large language models. The It's never been a human who's yeah. been at the core of our software. Um, so I think that transition was, was something that was very natural for us to, to do. Uh, it's still not without its challenges, which we can get into. Our technological path with large language models will likely mirror the path we took with NLU, mm -hmm. where... You know, we were using some models off the shelf that are third party. And at the same time, we run an internal process of built uh, training and uh, our own that we benchmark against them. Yeah. I remember it was, um, it was always uh, paramount for you all to own these capabilities. And it was three, four years ago, you all, you know, hired some very senior, uh, very expensive folks yeah. uh, that were focused on yeah. doing AI research. Yeah. And, you know, you would build a team mm -hmm. in, in Seattle, in Israel, and these are, are, are folks that are doing cutting edge AI research. How did you all think about that in terms of, you know, setting the groundwork? Did you see this coming? Did you know that there were going to be the explosion of now what we call generative AI? How did you all, you know, navigate that even early days, 2019, 2020? So I, I think we were very fortunate in that, you know, our, 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 our vision has always been to resolve every customer service conversation. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we knew we had to automate conversations, not only in messaging channels, but also over the phone, yep. voice channels too. So we were very fortunate to be able to bring in um, a lot of exceptional talent who's particularly skilled at voice AI. Mm, yep. And so we were, there are unique challenges to voice AI that are uh, quite distinct from messaging, messaging AI. And um, so we, there were some, some core folks we brought in who really helped us see around the corner with what mm -hmm. was happening. That sort of foresight um, turns out coincided with a major shift that's happening in our industry, yeah. which is that the contact center software and the CX software are really converging. It turns out that businesses they want their, uh, their agents in one place. Mm -hmm. And in order to provide a great customer experience, I think we know this as consumers, it's really annoying to chat with a business and then for the person you speak to on the phone to have no idea what you're talking about if you're, or if you're that interaction previously. So an omni-channel unified experience is what we're, we're really after. And we would think that RAI stands to be able to deliver that. So I think some of those folks that we brought in and we, we, we were fortunate to have the foresight to introduce really helped us see around the corner and, and kind of prepare for that unified future. Um, in terms of the, the chat GVT moment in particular, <laughs> um, which I, I think you're, is also what you're asking about, we did not see that coming. And we, we, the rate at which large language models improved was not something that I don't think anyone anticipated. We always envisioned a future where ADA uh, would, you would never have to build an AI agent in ADA. You would only ever just manage one. Mm -hmm. We would take care of the the generation for you. Yeah, the rate at which um, the that that we were keep, keep actually able to deliver that really surprised everyone inside it, and myself included. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why we're like couldn't be more excited about what we're building now. It, like the the our product is at a place now where I today where I thought it would have been. If you had this conversation a couple of years ago, I, I thought it would, this it would be like in. 2028 or 2029 that we'd be here now. Well, you know, fa fast forward, you know, you all have, you know, built a, a sizable company, you've scaled the team, you've scaled mm -hmm. revenues, you serve, uh, you know, some incredible customers today, Facebook, and then this hits overnight, or not yeah. overnight, but pretty, pretty quickly, yeah. where, you know, every company can now go and they can build their own, you know, FAQ bot. Mm -hmm. You know what, you all started in the early days by automating FAQs, yeah. Now you can go and grab, you know, any type of large language model, train your own data set, and you could go launch your own. Mm. How did you all deal with that? How are you navigating it? And then what does that mean for the future of what you all want to build? It's never been easier to automate conversations with your, your customer base, basic conversations. Um, I think for us, again, the, the way we think about value is... We are delivering the AI platform that helps businesses resolve the most customer service inquiries with the least effort. And the advent of, or the, of ChatGPT and the rate at which large language models are now um, capable of generating accurate language, um, I think that's, 
that's really just opened the world eye, world's eyes to the shift that's occurring in our industry. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that shift is one in which businesses are transitioning from a world um, that is uh, governed, at least in, digitally, by humans in, so, in, at the core of a software product to one in which AI is, is at the core of the software product. Uh, more broadly, I think we're we're starting to experience you know the equivalent of AI transformation, mm-hmm. where businesses need to learn what it means to run a, a their, their company when AI models are at their core and not um, not 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 human beings. And so I, I'd say that like this is we've seen a real acceleration in interest in how to become in the in the customer experience world. How do how do you become an AI first company? How do you make your customer service operations AI first? Um, and there are a few things that that we focus on that our our customers really appreciate in that regard that are are pretty distinct from trying to do this on your own. Yeah. The first is that um, we uh, are very good at understanding what resolution even means. Mm-hmm. So we we use uh, large language models to uh, automatically detect whether or not a conversation between you and your customer is truly resolved. Yeah. And that's a really big deal. We can now do this with greater than human accuracy. So we, we can automatically review a transcript and understand, did this customer actually get the help they were looking for? That's the first thing. And we, we enable all our customers to, um, to, to experience that level of measurement. And then secondly, we focus on enabling our customers to hire an AI agent, which is, you know, they, they could hire their own agent, so to, if they wanted, if they wanted to, uh, with rel- relatively easily. But it turns out the big problem to solve is how do you make this agent really smart over time? Mm-hmm. Much like when you hire a human employee, they're not that productive on day one. You got to onboard them. You got to equip them with your your strategy and and clear goals, and you got to measure their performance over time. And then you got to give them ongoing feedback to truly unlock the most value out of your employee. That just turns out that the exact same thing is true in an, in the AI native paradigm. Your your AI isn't that smart on day one. It needs to be coached and regularly um, re, re, given feedback regularly to truly have maximal impact. So we that's where we really focus as a company. One of the things for us is, um, you know, it was changing so rapidly. Mm-hmm. What our customers wanted, what the industry was expecting, and then also the capabilities for what was happening in our industries. Yeah. Um, I know for us, we had many conversations around what we wanted to do, the products that we wanted to build. Mm-hmm. But one of the things was really around the economic model mm-hmm. and around pricing. Maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how the business model started to change. Uh, you know, and, and anything else that kept you up at night or was a big challenge for you? De- definitely pricing has been something you and I have spent a lot of time together on, and that's been a huge focus for our, our company. The, the big change for us uh, has been a real, like really zeroing in on the core unit of value that Ada mm. provides its customers and monetizing that. Yeah. We've, we've always been focused on resolution. We always want to resolve the most. Mm-hmm. But for most of our company's history until relatively recently, we've charged per conversation. Yeah. And what happened, you know, during the pandemic as a result of, you know, rising customer service volumes is that our business did exceptionally well. But what also happened during the economic recession is that some businesses overestimated the amount of volume that they actually needed. Yeah. And that was hard. Um, that was that was uh, that was really challenging for us to support our customers through. We showed up for them, but um, it and that's al- in terms of you know uh, I, I would say re- retrades on pricing or mm-hmm. them wanting to recut contracts. That's right. Yeah. I mean, when our our whole our business is rooted on uh, our business model is connected to the volume of customer service conversations that we power for you. Um, when our customers' businesses are suffering, they have less customer service. We see that in our contract values. Yeah. Now, um, we also took that, well, that was really challenging. We took it as an opportunity to understand, hey, how could we solve this for our customers and better align ourselves with our customers? And what yeah. we came up with was a, a focus on not just any conversation mm-hmm. that we power. 
but we decided to focus on monetizing only the conversations that are really valuable. And we call that an automated resolution. And we use language models to actually measure, more accurately than a human now, whether or not a conversation is resolved. And, and so what, I, what I'd say is I think, you know, for folks who um, are thinking about their own pricing and packaging, for AI native companies who are thinking about, hey, how do I like, how do I think about, you know, monetizing the AI labor that I'm providing? It, it's valuable to, to consider, you know, how do you reduce the, the value, the, what is the core unit of value yeah. that your software provides? So, so you all have had to shift and is this, you know, and I think it's been a, a segment of the customer yeah. base, but you've had to go from pricing per conversation yeah. to now pricing on how I actually resolved the inquiry from an end customer. That's right. And in some cases for us, that means that the total volume, like the initial ACV that we monetize could be smaller, but over the long run, we know it's going to be far bigger. Yeah. And we know that it aligns the incentives between us and our customers and their customers yeah. in a way that wasn't possible before. So it's, it's, um, it's a, it was a tough call to make. Uh, but it's absolutely the right call for our customers and for our company. Yeah. What are the things still that uh, keep you up at night or make you nervous about, you know, where the yeah. industry is going and, and, and yeah. Ada's business model in whatever the new age of, of AI is going to look like? Focus keeps me up a lot at night. Yeah. Like I think I, I'm always sort of thinking, do we have the right level of focus as a company? Um, you know, we, we are, we are focused on resolving the most customer service conversations. But at times in our company's history, I've defined customer service pretty broadly. <laughs> and so we have, you know, we've built product that goes beyond, you know, customer service to um, internal customer service, yeah. for example. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, help we desk. help them, yeah, you might yeah. call employee experience, not yep. just customer experience. And um, so I, I think one, one thing that keeps me up at night is like, do we have the right focus? We certainly have ambitions of powering the entire customer journey. Um, right now we are focused exclusively on, on customer service and I'm making sure that our definitions align with what the right focus is. And I think, you know, you, you only achieve that, the right level of focus by just beating the drum yeah. and, uh, making sure that I think you're uncomfortable with it. Like my, my heuristic is. Like I should always feel, and our company should always feel uncomfortably focused. Yeah. One side is, hey, AI is going to help bring us out of a recession because mm -hmm. of the you know disruption that's happening and there's new economic models, there's gonna be new jobs, there's gonna be a lot more that's gonna be coming out of it. And then the flip side of that is, well, there's a ton of automation that's happening, so you're gonna eliminate jobs, you're gonna have to reallocate you know, some of the resources to other things. Yep. I'm curious for you, like, yeah. which way do you see it? And it's probably, you know, mixed or in the middle or some of, you know, both. Um, but where do you land on the future and, and how does AI play a role? I think it's a massive productivity unlock. Yeah. I just think we're going to look back on this period, at least in the customer service industry, and we're going to be shocked that we used to perform customer service the way that we used to. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the uncomfortable uh realities of that shift, however, is that there is a tremendous amount of labor displacement that will happen as a result of that. Yeah. And while it's so exciting to see our customers create new roles that didn't exist before, AI management roles mm -hmm. inside our software, and provide a new career path for customer service agent agents, it's also true that a lot of our customers elect to realize the savings they get from our software in the form of you know, smaller customer service teams. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, there is a, there is a, that's the history of automation. And there is something that for me, like I, I'm, I find that really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. I'd say one of the things, you know, as we've, as we've learned more and as we've seen the value, you know, a lot of folks have asked, if, is this a, is this a hype cycle? Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, one of the things that always is, 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 is against that argument is just, the sheer value and efficiency gains that we are seeing. You know, I think about, you know, the ability to be able to handle more of the inquiries that are coming on, increase CSAT while you're able to handle more customer conversations. Mm -hmm. I think about the, the different applications that are happening and, you know, where you're able to, you know, get productivity gains from your engineering teams, from mm -hmm. your customer support teams. 
and there's a lot of value that's being created. And so if you take away any of the hype or maybe any of the you know buzzy apps that will come and go, the underlying value is that you can get more done with less. Yeah. And you're able to, to build that. And I think you all are, are a great example of powering that and pioneering and bringing that into specifically customer support. How do you think about cutting through the hype? Like you, you're seeing, uh, you know, every company I'm sure that is pitching you right now has positioned themselves as a generative AI company. How do you cut through what is actually going to be increasing, providing more value to customers versus something that's just, you know, a marketing, a marketing line? Yeah, well, one of the things that um, you know I feel very fortunate at is, is that I've been at Excel now for for a good while, and one of the things that Excel always values is underlying good unit economics in the business. And so I think about you know when we've you know uh, been able to partner with Webflow and Qualtrics and Atlassian, those were great businesses before they ever took capital, and we focused on great underlying unit economics. Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at this next wave of artificial intelligence, you know, the, the ways that we've looked at it have been companies that have been able to really provide value. Yeah. And they've been able to provide that economic value and the unit economics makes sense. Now, it may be fuzzy in the beginning in the way that they're, you know, a, half, having to, you know, invest a lot in these models. They're having to, you know, gather a lot of data and forward invest. But when you fast forward and you can see that there's true value and that over time, that economic value is going to be realized and they're good underlying businesses, that yeah. gets us really excited. And so, you know, we, we just, uh, you know, announced and partnered with a company called Synthesia hmm. and they're building, you know, 3D avatars. And when, when folks are, are looking at that, it's, you know, hey, they've, you know, kind of come into this, this AI wave and a lot of folks have started to look at the, at the business. But the underlying businesses, they've gone into enterprises and sold the ability to not need to hire a production crew, mm -hmm. or you don't need your, your antiquated you know, consultants that are going to come in and train your workforce or do your onboarding or create a new you know, uh, uh, learning manual. Mm -hmm. And they've automated all of this software and built a very durable enterprise business. Those are the things that get me really excited. And you can cut through yeah. and, and kind of see where the real value is. I love I love how you put that. I, it strikes me that there's almost like a a like Juilliard music edition audition analogy to this. Like the way that music auditions from my understanding work is they're always done blind. The evaluators are just listening to the musicians. They can't see how the they can't see the musician. Yeah. And what you're doing is it's effectively the equivalent. You're looking at the P&L of the business. You're understanding, irrespective of the marketing and the flash and what the business looks like. And you're seeing, do they have, does it have a sound unit economics? Is the value actually being realized? Just so turns, it just so happens that AI is the way that yeah. that may be delivered. And it may be leading indicators and there may be other yeah. things, but you can actually see that there's true value that's being created. Yeah. Um, and that's that. That's kind of the way that we've been approaching. I, I think that's so. I think that's likely. My, my suspicion would be that's going to be common amongst the top performing companies in this next generation of AI native companies. Is that what what will be true amongst them is a relentless focus on the value that they create, not how not not the technology itself that delivers it. Yeah. And the reason I think that's so true is because if you're if you're really anchored on the the, the value it, itself, you are open to other means of actually delivering it. Yeah. And I think that's where like business durability is built. It's, it's, be, it's the businesses that are truly anchored on how they solve the, or look, the value they provide yeah. that are open to coming up with new ways of solving it in perpetuity. So, so for Ada, as you all are differentiating around the mm. customer support stack, mm. is it still going to be around you know, the integrations and taking action? Or is it going to be around how you train the agent and how you do your automation or your AI so that it can respond? Because, mm. I mean, that's one of the biggest things is like, how yeah. do you create these, you know, feedback yeah. loops around the data into the, into production and then gathering them? And what are the guardrails? What are the weights? What are the biases? How do you want to build the model? Yeah. How do you see ADA in the, in the new AI first world continuing to be uh, the authority there and, and yeah. bringing that that forward. So I think I think definitely uh, in the midterm, there's still a lot of value we provide by enabling your your agent to take action. Yeah, teaching your AI to actually do something uh, is pretty hard to do on your own, and Ada makes that way easier. In the distant future, however, I think really the vast majority of the value we provide 
is really as the coaching layer for your AI. Mm. Like I really, I almost think of AI, uh, Ada in the long term, almost like an HR application for your AI employees. Mm. It turns out you need this interface to be able to understand how well is this, is this AI agent performing and how do I help it improve faster? Mm. And I think it's going to be the company that, in, it, that drives the most rapid acceleration of the learning of the AI mm -hmm. that's going to accumulate most of the value and will, by virtue of that, power the most compelling customer experiences, let's see. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things about this is there's just so much data that is going to be created and those companies are going to become reliant upon that data. So whoever mm -hmm. owns it, is training it, is able to plug that back in, that's where there's gonna be so much value that's created. And so, um, you know, when I think about that, you know, if, if I am a company that's going to help run your, your, your support, where is that data gonna sit? Is that gonna sit with Ada? Are you gonna be able to help these companies as they're training that? Is it, they're gonna be a third party provider that helps them to clean up the data, to own the data, to bring it back in for how they're gonna train their AI models? I think so much of the economic value is going to be re reliant and dependent on who owns that data and who helps you to make those decisions long term. Yeah. And I, you have yeah. to figure out how you do the data exchange, how you can, you know, handle privacy, how you can store it. Like it's so valuable that you have. Mm. But, you know, it may not be that the customer support company is the one that knows how to own and be able to, you know, train and use that data. Yeah, I I I agree with that. I think that the the way we're seeing this play out is a customer hires an AI agent with Ada. That AI agent is the equivalent of an intern to start. But they use our software, the business uses our software to make that, a, that intern a uh, top performing employee over yeah, time. Yeah. And what, what, what's looking like it's starting to happen is that the relationship with that employee, the AI employee, becomes one in which like Firing that employee is, is sort of the, becomes the equivalent of letting go of like 10,000 people. <laughs> That's a really, really difficult thing to walk away from because you've, you've turned this one employee into an army of 10,000 and you, you've sort of earned this productivity unlock and um, switching vendors or moving to a different application um, means letting that go. Yeah. And so I, th I think, th I, I suspect that that'll be the case across most software categories. What's well, uh, nice, creating a lot more lock in that. I think, I yeah. think it will. Um, uh, but I think it'll also change procurement processes. Yeah, and totally. I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think CIOs will have questions about this and what happens with the data that they, that they the instructions and coaching that they've given to, yeah. to improve this AI over time. Yeah, I think there's going to be a big unlock there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're still in the early innings of figuring that out and how that data transfer and how that lock-in is going to be created. Yeah, and how the value is, how, how the businesses even think about value. I think one of the, the psychology of buying AI native software is very different. Like, right, we've spoken so much about the psychology of building an AI native company. There needs to be deeper consideration about the psychology of purchasing AI native software it's actually pretty different. It's a pretty it's 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 fundamentally different to buy a piece of software and to expect its value to be way greater in the future than mm -hmm. it is today. Yeah. And that requires different types of different type of modeling and it requires a different type of education on behalf of sellers mm -hmm. to the, the 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 key stakeholders that they're they're engaging. I think I agree with you. We're we're in the early innings of understanding yeah. how to do this well. Thank you for doing this. It's hey. Awesome. Really appreciate you coming in. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Fletch. It was fun. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. On the next episode of Spotlight on AI, you will hear from Shen Zi Ding, the CEO and co-founder of Merge, and Ben Fletcher, a partner at Excel. I really think that something is here and it's going to keep getting worse, and we can really solve this.